In the gospel according to St. Mark, the eighth chapter, verse 37, you'll find these words pinned there, a very familiar verse. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For a few moments, I want to talk to you from the subject of profit and loss. Profit and loss. Let us pray. Gracious let him, Father, remove me out the way. Let not my voice be heard, but let your voice be heard in me. Father God, don't let me be seen, but let your spirit be seen in me. Father God, don't let me go before the cross this morning, but let the cross go before me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of thy heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and redeemer. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Prophet and loss. These verses of scripture were spoken by Jesus to his disciples while they were yet in training. Somebody tell your neighbor, that's us. That's us. We're disciples in training. Yep. Uh, they were in Caesarea Philippi where a small crowd of followers had gathered to hear what he had to say. Why were they so anxious to hear Jesus? Well, they had already, he had already fed thousands in Galilee with a few loaves of bread and some small fish. And if you want to gather black folk together, give, you, give away some free food. Word like that travel fast. So they figured they came, he'd be feeding them again. So they said, why pass up a good meal? And the disciples and the followers were about to hear something that they never heard before. It's the parable that I like to call profit and loss. Do I have any mathemati mathematician uh, or geniuses in the house? I know that two plus two always equals four, but today I'm going to shake your mathematical foundation a bit, and I'm going to try to propose to you that two plus two equals zero. Yeah. What if in order to maximize the return on your invested dollar, you had to give that dollar away? Are you confused? Well, you're not the first person to be confused. Imagine you have two items of value, and you need cash fast. Mm. Maybe you have Jackie Robinson's rookie baseball card in one hand and your mother's diamond ring in another. Both are precious to you. But if you have to place a monetary value on either one, there are standards you can use to establish the value of both. The hard part would not be knowing what uh, each is worth monetary terms, but deciding which one are you willing to part with. Am I right about it? A thing of value cannot always be measured in dollars. There's some folk out there that recovered, recovered from COVID that'll tell you that you can't put a price on being able to breathe. Right. Jesus throws a wrench in our standard mathematical wheelhouse calculations by giving us a formula that is to Wall Street geniuses makes very little sense at all. It's an idea of secular profit and spiritual loss. It's a very cautious calculation because it breaks from the norm about profit and loss. In this calculation, the soul is on one side and the world is on the other. Mm -hmm. Secular matters on one hand and spiritual matters on the other hand. Your soul on one hand and a prestigious lifestyle on the other hand. Uh, driving a hoop to your driving a Benz. Uh, living in the hood and living in Beverly Hills. Uh, Eating at McDonald's or eating at a Steak and Owls. Some of y'all may not remember Steak and Owls, but if you're an old school Detroiter, Steak and Owls was the place to be. <laughs> but it's common practice, and still is today, for merchants or businessmen to reconcile their books. And they would make a year-end assessment of their records and balance their accounts to determine their profit and their loss. But here's the problem. Jesus was asking them to weigh the value of their possessions against the value of their soul. 
How do you weigh your soul against your secular achievements? The system of weight and measures we use to calculate value will not handle this equation. See, there's no common standard by which you can compare two things that are so different in nature. They have no common factor. My mathematicians will understand when I say these two stand prime to each other. Uh, further, Jesus complicates this seemingly impossible equation with the question. What do it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? How would you answer that question, United? Where do you place the value of your life? On things below, on things above. We all understand what it means to profit, so what do you value your life? Some of us say we can't wait to get to heaven, but let's be honest about it. We're not in a rush to get there. We say we want God's kingdom to come, but we sure don't want to be here when Armageddon comes. We say we believe in Jesus' role, died for our sins, and that we one day will rise up with him, but we ain't trying to go down on the ground too quickly. So where all does this come from? What makes the comparison from the standpoint of profit? Well, first, there's the supposed profit. We can't even imagine gaining the whole world as our profit. We might win the lottery for a million, even a hundred million, but we might land a perfect job that affords us the opportunity to buy a home and a nice ride. You might achieve respected status of a, of a noted world leader, but there's still not the whole world. It's impossible that anyone would ever gain the whole world. Even Alexander the Great, who conquered the provinces of Asia Minor in three great battles, penetrated and subdued the people to the furthest limits, north, south, east, and west, had to admit, standing on the banks of the Indian Ocean, that he arrived to the limits of his career as a warrior. Even Alexander the Great had to understand that he couldn't conquer the whole world. When we were growing up, we heard comments like, the world is your oyster and the sky is the limit. We were taught that we can get, that we were to get all we can out of this life. No one has ever obtained the world. No individual, no corporation, no nation, and certainly no one I know. But let's suppose for just a minute that one person was able to obtain the whole world. Imagine for a moment that this person possessed all the convenience and comforts and all the riches and honors, all the pleasures, praises, and profits. And they all at the command of just one person. Now put all this on the scale and weight its profits against the value of your soul. Would it be enough to cause you to cast your soul in a trash heap? Before you answer that question, Consider the duration of profit. You got to consider the supposed profit. But secondly, you got to consider the duration of profit. Will the monetary gains you have made continue? There's no way to calculate with any certainty whether you will possess the world's gain for your entire life. It might be gone in a few years. But even if it did last a lifetime, how long will your life last? After all, James reminds us that we don't know what tomorrow will bring. For he wrote, for what is your life if even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away? There's only one breath between life and death. And this parable of the rich man whose bonds were full, God responds to him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. So when we are socked away with our dollars and invest all our comforts of life, we're only assuming that we will outlive the warranties of our purchases. The profit of the world is not meant to last. Sooner or later, our cherished possessions will belong to somebody else. Whether by death, by force, or fraud, or casualty, somebody else is going to own what you own. Matter of fact, you want to see some families fall out? Let somebody die and leave a sock with a hole in it. Folk will fight over that sock and a hole with it as if that's the best sock in the whole wide world. 
even if we possess everything the world has to offer, we run the risk of losing it or having it taken away from us, having it snatched right from us, being forced to give it all up or just leaving it behind. I'll never forget I purchased uh, uh, my first car when I got out, when I became a pilot. And I uh, uh, got a job working for uh, Masaba Airlines, excuse me, Chicago Airlines. I've got myself a Chrysler Concorde. I brought that Concorde home to Detroit, was proud to show my mom and daddy I bought myself a grown man's car. You got to see, I upgraded myself from a Nissan Sentra to a Chrysler Concorde. I was proud. I came home and parked my car outside my parents' house, said, Daddy, come take a look at my brand new car. I went outside and guess what? The car was gone. I said, Daddy, I know I parked it right here. But Pookie and Ray Ray decided I didn't need that car and they took it up off of me. You see, church, you can possess all the possessions you want and somebody can come and take it in the twinkling of an eye. Tell your neighbor, fortunes are fleeting. So we have to consider the supposed profit. We have to consider the duration of profit. But finally, it wouldn't be fair if we did not discuss the enjoyment of profit, even if you're able to sustain your possession and stop Pookie and Ray Ray from stealing your brand new car, the world is never failing proprietorship and you still cannot enjoy it all. With all that we know of life in medicine, geology, and botany, even our knowledge of the terrestrial plane. There's still so much more to learn and digest. Gaining the whole world would be like swallowing a model melon whole and then choking on it. As long as there is undiscovered value in what we possess, we cannot fully enjoy all that God has to offer. Even if a thousand cattle on a hill were yours, even if you own all the gold and silver and precious stones yet to be excavated, you, what could you do with it all? Considering your limited capacity to store it for enjoyment alone, you would just build more barns that just would fill up with stuff and more stuff. An unknown author wrote, man needs a little down here, but doesn't need it for that long. The world, if we could possess it, keep it, and enjoy it fully, would still not satisfy us. We would need something to hope for. Because we find pleasure in hope, in the pursuit of hope that daily feeds us. Even when we try and fail and try again and fail, we still have hope. Yes, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? With all our hope and all our successes in this life, all of our assets and acquisitions will never be a greater value than your own soul. Yeah. Why consider what your soul is worth? First is the price paid for it. Christ died for you so that your soul would be preserved blameless until he returns. Yeah. Apart from Christ, your soul has no joy. Your soul has no meaning. It has no comfort. It has no refuge. It has no hope. Look at the person who is an atheist or an agnostic. They have nothing to hope for, nothing to look forward to. They live just to live. They walk just to walk. They talk just to talk. They do just to do. But only these you do in Christ shall last. For those of us that know the Savior, when we give, we give because Christ gave to us. When we love, we love because Christ loved us. When we do because Christ did for us. You see, when you got Jesus, you got hope. Hope for tomorrow. Hope for today. Hope that everything is going to work out. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. But second, consider who has the right to possess your soul. This is where it gets tricky. Mama used to tell me I brought you in this world and I'll take you out. But I got news for mama. God breathed the breath. God breathed into my ass nostrils the breath of life. 
God made man and became him a living soul. Yes, mama and daddy may have birthed me, but I still belong to God. You may belong to your mama and father for a while, but at the end of the day, God sits on the throne all by himself. It's God who breathes the breath of nostril in your life. You think that alarm you woke you up this morning? It was nothing but God that woke you up. You think you're walking on your own free will on the court? It's God that gives you the power to move. Not your mother, not your father, but God. God gave your soul life. God gave you the power to get off your rusty dust and go to work. God gave you all that you had. But then third, consider the soul's capacity for joy. They say, bless the Lord, oh my soul. And all that was in me, bless his holy name. Your soul wants to sing glory to God. Your soul wants to give God praise. Your soul wants to shout out hallelujah. If you think about the happiest moments of your life, it's when you were in lock and key with the Lord. You see, some of us like they don't give God credit, but it's God that deserves all the credit for our ups. Consider the soul's fourth, consider your soul's immortality. Your fortress may turn into ruin. But the flame of your immortal soul cannot be extinguished. That's why Jesus said, fear not them which kill the body, that, but they are not able to kill your soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Your soul will be around for eternity. The only question is, where will your soul live when this earthly house of your tabernacle is dissolved? Will your soul live in a house not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens? Or will you go to the other place where there's garnishing and gashing of teeth? So let me pose the question again. Uh, one that Jesus posed with disciples over 2,000 years ago. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Family, I want you to know the answer is a resounding nothing. Your hope for your profit rests with the Lord. So when you hope, you don't hope for a winning lottery ticket. A winning lottery ticket, most of those folk go broke anyway. Don't hope for a better job. They may fire you anyway. Don't hope for a bigger bank account. That just means bigger taxes. Don't hope for a bigger house. That's just a bigger heat bill. Hope in your God will take care of your soul. Your profit will be lost if you have no hope in Jesus. Your hope in Christ and your soul will profit from eternal life. Your hope in Christ and your souls will have eternal justification. Your hope in Christ and your soul's eternal fellowship with God. Your hope in Christ for your soul's eternal bliss with God. Your hope in Christ and your soul's eternal comfort. You see, church, I've come to find out that when it all boils down is this right here. No matter what I go through, no matter what I experience, whether it be profit or loss down here, I'm able to do all things through Christ Jesus that strengthened me. Even on my bad day, as long as I'm covered by the blood, I can make it through another day. Is there anybody here that knows that you're covered by the blood? It's the blood that saved you. It's the blood that rescued you. It's the blood that kept you whole. Even when they took my job, but the blood sustained me. Even when the doctor gave me a bad bill of health, it was the blood that kept me going. It was the blood of Jesus that kept my mind when everybody else was driving me crazy. Is there anybody here that needed God to regulate your mind? It didn't matter what the profit and loss statement was. Jesus was on the main line and I had to call on him because nothing else worked. The psychologist gave me a bill. I still went crazy. The doctor gave me medicine. I was still sick. But when God put the blood on me, it was the blood that made me whole. It was the blood that kept my mind stayed on him. It was the blood that kept me going. Is there anybody here that's covered in the blood? Say yes. It was the blood when I lost my grandma. 
that kept my mind stayed on him. It was the blood when I lost my godmother that kept me stayed on him. It was the blood when I had a heart attack that kept me stayed on him. It was the blood when they fired me that kept me stayed on him. It was the blood when my children went crazy that kept me stayed on him. It was the blood when they cut the lights off that lit up the house. It was the blood when I was hungry that fed me. It was the blood, the blood of Jesus. Nothing, 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 nothing but the blood. I don't care how much you pay me. You can take it all away. Just keep me covered in the blood. You can give me all the medicine you want. Keep me covered in the blood. You can make my relationship all jacked up. But keep me covered in the blood. It's the blood that gets me home. It's the blood of Jesus that makes me profitable. It's the blood of Jesus that keeps me from losses. It's the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. Nothing, nothing, nothing but the blood. Yes. Nothing but the blood. Somebody here this morning knows you almost went crazy, but you got on your knees, got in your prayer closet, had a little talk with Jesus, told him all about your problem, and God made it right with you. It was nothing but the blood that kept you whole. Nothing but the blood that brought you through. You were struggling. You were hurt. You were without, but the blood. Stand to your feet. There might be somebody here today. Who doesn't know Christ and the pardon of your sins. The door to the church open for you, my brother, my sister. 